It's March 1974. The Betts family, Jerry, Antoine, and their son Terry, are walking through the woods at their estate on Fort George Island. As they enjoy their spring walk, little do they know that today they'll come across something that'll change their lives forever. As Terry walks ahead, he can feel something pulling him towards an unknown object. Unsure of what to make of this feeling, but curious to pursue whatever's calling to him. Terry, where are you going? His mother calls out, but he ignores her and frantically tries to find this unknown thing. He wants it. He needs it. And then he can see something. A shiny silver sphere, the size of a bowling ball, nestling among the grass. As Terry approaches it, he notices it's eerily untouched, with no damage or dirt on it. Terry picks it up. It's heavy, but he holds it tight. Always finding junk where you go, his father laughs. Terry was always collecting strange metallic objects. He found them fascinating. It's just a souvenir, that's all. The three of them look at the ball, all intrigued by the perfect shiny sphere. As they walk back home, they excitedly discuss its possible origins. Fantasizing the possibilities that maybe it's a cannonball used by conquistadors, or that it could have fallen from a NASA satellite in orbit. They arrive home, and Terry places the mysterious ball on a windowsill in his room, next to many of his other exhibits, and it sits there for now. Two weeks pass, and Terry has a friend over. They hang out and take turns playing the guitar. Terry strikes a chord, and a vibration occurs that comes from the windowsill. The boys sit silently, spooked by the unknown sound. They look around to find where it came from. It's probably just a possum, Terry says calmly. But as he raises his pick, he looks towards the sphere suspiciously. As he strikes another chord, he sees the sphere vibrate, and this time, it's also emitting a humming sound. Terry puts down the guitar and approaches the ball, and as he reaches toward it, the sound slowly fades. Startled, he stands in silence before calling out to his dad. Terry explains the strange phenomenon to his father. Antoine looks at it closely, then holds it up to his ear. As he shakes it vigorously, he can feel something inside the ball moving. Shocked, he places it down on a table. Once placed, it begins to roll, moving towards one edge of the table, then circling around, moving corner to corner in a rectangle, endlessly searching for something, possibly an exit, until finally it rolls back to the middle, becoming motionless once more. They all look at the ball puzzled by the display, and Antoine places the ball on the floor. As soon as it touches the surface, it quickly rolls toward the door, This time, it's clear the sphere wants to make an escape. The thing is too valuable to lose, and Terry quickly chases after it. He grabs it before it leaves the house. He places the ball somewhere safe inside a box, incapable of another escape attempt. Over the following days, Terry took it upon himself to make his own experiments. He found that when within the sunlight, it appeared to be more active. His opinion was that it reacted to solar radiation. When hit with a hammer, it would ring out loudly, as though it felt the strike. Strange things also occurred in the Betts family home. Doors would suddenly slam shut at night, and strange organ music played throughout the house, even though they didn't own an organ. The family sat down to discuss the sphere. They felt it was something truly extraterrestrial, and they required professional advice. The authorities came to review the ball, puzzled by the object, as it moved in an unpredictable way. But they couldn't recognize what it was or provide an explanation for it. All they could confirm was that it didn't come from another planet. The Betts family disagreed and wanted a second opinion. They sent it to Dr. J. Allen Hynek, an astronomer and expert in the extraterrestrial. He spent six hours reviewing the sphere. Through his many examinations, the doctor found that the strange sphere emitted radio waves and had its own magnetic field. 
With this new information, the Betzes were interviewed by a reporter. The mysterious sphere quickly became famous. Its story spread in papers throughout the USA and even made the news internationally. Everyone wanted to know more about this mysterious sphere. A television crew soon visited the Betts' house, hoping to experience the extraterrestrial object firsthand. The sphere was placed on the ground. It did its usual trick, and the visitors stood there, speechless at what they were witnessing. The reporters asked to place the family's poodle next to the ball to provide an indication of the sphere's size. As the dog sat next to it, it began to whimper and covered its ears with its paws, something it had never done before around the ball. The Betts family felt they had something truly valuable and insured it through Lloyds of London. And if they left it at home, they had someone stay to watch it, ensuring no one would steal it or let it escape. But what was the mysterious bet sphere really? When responding to the press, the spokesman from the authorities revealed the sphere was made from high-grade stainless steel. Although the sphere wasn't something they made themselves, it was still likely created somewhere on Earth. If it came from outer space, they advised it would be made from different elements. Their review showed the shell of the sphere is 1 inch thick and hollow inside. It weighed 22 pounds the exact weight for that amount of stainless steel. It had no seams on it, the shell was scuffed in parts, and had a small triangular mark 3 millimeters long. They were sure it was just a steel ball. But they wanted to confirm further by using x-rays. They found small beads of residue inside. These beads would have been caught inside the object when it was manufactured. Clarifying why there was a feeling of movement inside the ball, They also solved the mystery of the strange movement, as it's a perfectly balanced sphere. Sitting on the slightest uneven surface would cause it to roll. The Betz's house had uneven stone floors, and it had only ever been witnessed to move around there. The authority also wanted to cut it open to prove their assessment. However, the Betz's were adamant that it couldn't be damaged. It was identified further that the sphere was just a ball check valve produced by the Bell & Gossett Company. The ball's size, weight, and metallurgic composition match perfectly to what they made. Confirming how it managed to make the journey to the Betz' estate three years before the discovery of the sphere, an artist, James Derling Jones, had collected a few of these ball check valves. He liked to use them in his sculptures. With no room inside of his bus, He put them on the top of the roof rack. His journey took him past the Betz' estate, and along the way, a few of these balls happened to roll off and were lost. At least until Terry came along one fine spring day. But what about the radio waves and odd magnetic properties confirmed by Dr. Hynek? Well, although Antoine claimed that's what was found, it was never confirmed to be true with the doctor. The 1970s were a heyday for all things out of our planet, and anything related would gain popularity immediately. The authorities only enhanced this by providing monetary rewards for supporting evidence. Finding something extraterrestrial could have been just a ploy by the Betzes for a cash reward. It's a mystery. Nobody knows exactly who created this substance. Was it nature? or some scientists in a fancy lab somewhere. It's spreading quickly. The stuff gets into every human, animal, even the tiniest insect. All of humanity's experiencing euphoria, but that feeling won't last forever. This new molecule attaches itself to all living DNA and makes it immortal. That's how it starts. For the past few months, you've been sitting at home in an information vacuum. No internet, no TV, no news. You turned off your phone and canceled all your plans with your friends so that nobody can distract you. Only with this drastic plan will you be able to finish writing your book. You sit in your rented house on the edge of town, writing every day. You have absolutely no idea what's going on in the world. And now, finally, the book is finished. You grab your bike and head off to celebrate with a beautiful ride around town. The streets are full of people. 
You ride along a narrow street until you reach the town square. There's a pretty big crowd, and you accidentally crash into a young guy. You say you're very sorry, but the guy looks somehow extra happy. He says he's fine. You notice that the crowd of people is shouting positive slogans, and everyone's in a really good mood. You pick up your bike and look down at yourself. You seem fine, but the fall was kind of painful. Better go to the hospital, just in case, you think, and leave the square. You've never seen such an empty hospital before. You approach reception and ask for a doctor or a nurse, who's ever free. The receptionist looks at you with that face that says, What's this guy's deal? You say you hurt yourself falling off a bike. Where have you been in the last few weeks? The receptionist asks. You notice that, actually, your body doesn't hurt anymore. Huh, how's that even possible? You look around and realize that there's no one else in the building except you and the weirded-out receptionist. Where are all the people? You run out into the street, pull out your phone, and read the latest news. An unusual molecule is spreading around the world, making people immortal. The human heart now beats forever. Any damage heals in a matter of minutes. There are no more diseases. Everyone's been cured. Not only that, everyone's suddenly in excellent shape. Scientists are still trying to figure out what this molecule is. But while they're doing that, people all over the world are celebrating. It's the beginning of eternal life. A year passes. Hospitals are closing all over the world. Doctors have no one left to heal. Vets are also out of work, because animals also live forever now. Health insurance companies go bankrupt, so do life insurance firms. Never in all of history have people felt so safe. A year later, the economy goes crazy. In every field, the story's the same. From drivers to coal miners to psychologists to musicians to influencers. Even just working a regular cash register at the supermarket. The competition is insane. The population is way bigger, so there's thousands of people showing up to every interview. More people, more mouths. Food and clothes become even more expensive. Five years later, you can no longer go out into the city and find a quiet street to walk on. There's always a crowd of people. A huge number of new houses are built. Prices for real estate, internet, electricity, every service, it all just keeps rising. And at the same time, it's more and more difficult to earn good money. Many people just lose their jobs. Scientists are sounding the alarm. In 50 years, there'll be almost no space left on Earth. But that isn't even the main problem. Insects now live forever, too. Locusts, beetles, mosquitoes, spiders, flies, there are trillions of them. Pests eat everything. Fields are empty. Bees, bats, and spiders usually help out by chomping on their share of insects. But now the whole system's gone out of whack. They, and by that I mean every insect in the world, become more aggressive and start to attack small towns and villages. Herbivores are everywhere, because why bother chasing after food? A lion can just wait around. Eventually, something's just going to land in its lap. Lions, tigers, leopards, wolves, hyenas. They get lazy and fat. Wild animals fill city streets. The hottest new job? The control and capture of wild animals. And it's not exactly an easy job. You try chasing down a hyena in a three-story parking lot. By the way, all living things can now sort of live without food. But everyone still feels hungry, and if you don't eat, your body will definitely start feeling weak. Some vloggers tried to find out how long they could last without food. Turns out that the body can live forever without nutrients. But after about a month, you'll just fall into a deep dream. It's like your brain puts you into sleep mode. Unemployment is finally getting under control. There are millions of new construction jobs. What's the big new project? Well, people are building cities in the oceans and creating aerial towns, held up by a million helicopter-like thingies. So now, everyone has a place to live. The only problem? Humans are running out of natural resources fast. 50 years later, 
The Earth is inhabited by more than 50 billion people. Almost every forest is long gone, and freshwater sources are running dry. People stop catching animals, they simply learn to live with them. You can have a monkey, a porcupine, and a monitor lizard in your house all at the same time. It seems that animals have figured out that there's no point being afraid of humans or each other. Plus, humans and animals are everywhere, so there's not a lot of options. People finally managed to stop insects from spreading everywhere. Chemists and biologists teamed up to create a substance that puts all pests in an internal sleep. It gets sprayed on every crop now. Scientists also generated artificial food using simple chemical elements. But still, there's not enough food. And even with those ocean cities and floating towns, people are running out of room faster than ever. Humans institute a ban on any new ocean cities. Photoplankton and seaweed are essential for maintaining oxygen levels. And since there are almost no trees left, oceans have become even more important. The floating towns turn out to be a ridiculously bad idea. They release a huge amount of greenhouse gases, which makes breathing more challenging. Next plan? Space. The International Space Station is no longer the only huge thing in Earth's orbit. The wealthy build orbiting mansions with simulated Earth conditions. These huge, fancy space homes are crazy expensive and eat up even more natural resources. 75 years later, Mars and the Moon have been colonized, but people don't live there. They sleep, kinda. To reduce the burden on the Earth, people decided to live off-planet in turns. One-third of the population remains on Earth. The other part goes into cryogenic sleep for five years at a time. Cryogenic capsules are sent to Mars and the Moon. As soon as a human wakes up, they return to Earth and switch places with someone else. Every year, the amount of people in cryo chambers gets bigger and bigger. The next idea is to send out a fleet of unmanned spacecraft to try and find a habitable planet or moon somewhere. But to do this, people need to use up even more natural resources – gold, copper, silver, water, wood, oil, minerals, and metals. Humanity starts exploring Mars and the Moon, desperate to find something useful for building better spaceships. Some Earthlings are now celebrating their 150th birthday and have become incredibly smart and wise. They understand that it's time to stop the uncontrolled population growth, at least for a while. In the next 60 years, not a single person is born. Astrophysicists are still looking for planets in space that are suitable for life, and still figuring out how to get there. 1,000 years later, and humans now inhabit a bunch of new Earth-like planets. Our home, Earth, is completely devastated. There are no humans left there. And for some reason, the further we get from Earth, the more people are born with immunity to the immortal molecule. After all this time, people are living normal life cycles again, just not on this planet. Okay, place those goggles over your eyes, strap in, and don't forget to hold on tight. We're going to see how fast we can really go. Long legs and a tall yet muscular frame, not exactly the norm when compared to the shorter builds of short-distance runners. But the fastest man alive makes it look easy to move that fast. So far, the fastest anyone has run is just over 27 miles per hour, a speed reached briefly by sprinter Usain Bolt at the halfway point of his world record 100-meter dash. And humans can go even faster. The top speed we could reach may come down to how quickly the muscles in our body can move. Our muscles should be able to reach speeds as fast as 40 miles per hour. The reason we can't do it is that we're in the air for too long. Our limbs can only take a certain amount of force when they strike on the ground. That's why on skates, you're able to outpace a runner. Gliding allows for more traction. What would make us a lot faster is simple-ish. Longer legs, really wide hips, or extra legs, like an insect. i give running on all fours a try. It would be fun at least. In 2016, speed records weren't just broken on the running track, they were broken on the ski slopes in France. 
The world record for downhill skiing belongs to an Italian ski instructor and a mountain guide. In 2016, assisted only by gravity, the instructor set a human land speed record of around 158 miles per hour, skiing across the zone near the bottom of a course in just over two seconds. Well, I can barely stand up on skis, let alone move half that fast. The fastest a tiger beetle can sprint is up to 5 miles per hour. Doesn't sound that fast, really, but consider this. It's covering 120 of its body lengths in a single second. For comparison, Bolt covers about 6 body lengths per second. To match this beetle, he'd have to run about 480 miles per hour. That's twice as fast as a peregrine falcon. Tiger beetles have extremely sharp eyesight for insects, but while they're running, the world turns into a featureless smudge. This means the beetle has to stop every now and then and see where it's going. So they're pretty fast, but there's a mite, a special mite, whose speed is equivalent to a human running roughly 1,300 miles per hour. At its quickest, this sesame seed-sized mite can move 322 body lengths per second. Wow! Most cats run zero times their body length for the majority of the day. Yeah. Well, we're not going to be moving that fast anytime soon. We've got a few tricks up our sleeve, thanks to our big brains. We can use technology. Ooh. The fastest we've ever traveled on land over one mile is 763 miles per hour. It was done back in 1997 in Nevada in a thrust SSC. That's a big improvement from the first holder of the record. In 1898, a Frenchman hit the actually pretty amazing speed of 39 miles per hour in his electric-powered car. Through the air, we've traveled at Mach 3.3, that's around 2,100 miles per hour. It's all thanks to the fastest jet aircraft in the world, the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird. Amazingly, this plane doesn't have a top speed. The only thing limiting its speed is temperature. If it was allowed to fly as fast as it wanted, it would literally melt in midair. On water, the speed record is just over 275 knots, or a little over 317 miles per hour. A jet-powered hydroplane called the Spirit of Australia did it back in 1978. Not bad if you want to get to your favorite fishing spot quickly. In 1896, there weren't that many driving laws. But still, Walter Arnold decided to break one of them and became the first man in history to receive a speeding ticket. The speed limit at the time was 2 miles per hour. You could have walked faster, and most people did. But that was too slow for Arnold, who decided to race through the town at 8 miles per hour. Eventually, he was caught and received a one-shilling fine. Quite hefty for the time. A man named Felix was taken over 127,000 feet into the edge of space in a balloon that, when fully inflated, was about the size of the Statue of Liberty. Having no choice but to jump out, he eventually reached the fastest freefall speed ever, 843 miles per hour in a specially designed suit, of course. Landing back on solid ground in just over 9 minutes. He became the first person to break the sound barrier in freefall. The fastest speed a human has ever traveled is around 25,000 miles per hour. The crew of Apollo 10 reached this on May 26, 1969. This was also the highest speed ever reached by a manned vehicle. Are you feeling the hankering for speed yet? <laughs> Good news! The Earth rotates once roughly every 24 hours. Math, math, math. Hmm. This means that the Earth and you are spinning at around 1,000 miles per hour. It's not including how fast we're all moving through space on this giant rock. We're zipping along at 18 miles per second. That's 67,000 miles per hour through the dark vacuum of space. Our Sun and the Milky Way appear to be moving at an average speed of 448,000 miles per hour through space. While that sounds extremely fast, and it is, it still take about 230 million years to travel all the way around the Milky Way. So, you're probably moving a lot faster than you thought you were, but there's a good reason you're not a human puddle right now. Speed obviously isn't the issue. 
The real issue is acceleration. Changes in speed are expressed in g-forces, which just means the acceleration of an object relative to Earth's gravity. If you're sitting on the sofa, you're experiencing 1g. Now, most of us can withstand up to 4 to 6 g's, like on a roller coaster. Some pilots manage up to about 9 g's for a second or two. But sustained g-forces are a big problem. Some pilots wear special high g-suits and are trained to flex their torso muscles to keep blood from whooshing out of their heads and into their legs. They can still operate their aircraft properly at about 9 g's. The record for temporary g's is an amazing 82.6 g's. Riding a rocket-powered sled backward in 1958, Eli Beating Jr. hit the brakes and stopped in a tenth of a second as part of testing for space travel. Blacking out but only suffering back bruises, it was a remarkable demonstration of the body's resilience to short bursts of deceleration. More than 100 years ago, a super-famous scientist named Einstein came up with an idea called relativity. There was an experiment that tested this out with two clocks set to the exact same time. One clock stayed on Earth, while the other flew on a commercial plane. After the airplane returned from its trip around the world, the two clocks were compared. The clock on the fast-moving plane was slightly behind the other one. So yes, time travel is a real thing if you're going faster than another object. Now, another place time slows down is when you're in line at the checkout stand at the supermarket. But hey, it's all relative. The safest place to test high-speed travel is space. It's an empty vacuum, after all. But imagine speeding through space. Anything the size of a grain of sand would become a high-speed projectile. The real danger, though, would be small hydrogen atoms just floating around. The hydrogen would shatter into particles that would pass into the ship. It wouldn't be pretty. Your spacecraft would also heat up really quickly, too. Sounds dangerous. You go first.